Well, greetings to you, my dear friends in Christ, and thank you for clicking on our worship video for this weekend. My name is Pastor Peter Moore. I am the pastor at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Centralia, Washington, and it is good to be the church, even if it means right now we are only the church uh, through uh, online worship. Our, uh, I check our COVID numbers for Lewis County, and they used to be um, around 30, 35, 40, kind of had plateaued there, which isn't good, but then they spiked up over 200 the last couple weeks, so that's why we canceled all in-person activities. Last I checked, it was still 177, which is ridiculously high the number of new cases with this Omicron variant. So we're still waiting, uh, postponing all in-person activities. I'd like to see the numbers come back down uh, under 50. Uh, uh, and uh, some people are saying, well, with maybe Ash Wednesday, Lent. I don't know, we're, do we're kind of taking it week by week. So stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, the uh, worship hymns, the readings, the prayers, the sermon, everything is being provided here on our YouTube channel. And if you're listening to this, then you managed to find it. Congratulations. Um, so no other announcements other than we're kind of waiting to see what this Omicron spike does. But uh, certainly will you uh, join with me in an opening prayer. Let us pray. Most holy God, indeed, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the earth is filled with your glory. And Lord, with your angels and with the saints above, we stand in awe of your glory. Lord, expand, widen, enlarge our vision that we're able to see your power at work in the world, especially, Lord, in the unlikely places through the unlikely people. By your grace, Lord, fill our mouths with the words of the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Earth and 
Hi. The first reading is from Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. <clears throat> and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Here ends the reading. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Here ends the reading. The Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and, to, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. So this last week, a group of Irish fishermen faced down the Russian Navy. Who do you think won? I don't know, did you hear this story in the news? So the Russian Navy announced that it was gonna do some combat drills and live fire testing in uh, waters that happened to be the ancestral fishing grounds for Southern Ireland. So it turned into this tense and kind of awful game of chicken uh, with the, the fishermen, announcing that these waters were their livelihood and they would be fishing, missile tests or no. And the Russian Navy said, we're still gonna be firing our missiles and doing our combat drills until, it's a game of chicken, right? Who's gonna turn aside? The Russian Navy backed down. A spokesman for the Irish fisherman, Patrick Murphy, doesn't get more Irish than that, does it? He said, you wouldn't expect the Russian nation to listen to a couple of fishermen, but they did. So what does it take? What does it take to get an Irish fisherman to stop fishing? More than the Russian Navy, that's for sure. So tell me, what could make a fisherman leave their nets and leave their fishing grounds? So of course, just like the Irish fishermen in our um, news today, the first disciples called by Jesus in our gospel text for today, this was their 
livelihood, their profession handed down from generation to generation, father to son, father to son, the boats, the nets, everything. This was all that they knew. It was a, a, the family business. It was the only means of support. This was their life. And like the Irish fishermen, I bet not even the Russian Navy could bully them off of their fishing boats and their fishing grounds. So how is it that by the end of the gospel story, Peter and James and John are leaving their boats, leaving their nets, leaving their families, walking away from their ancestral fishing waters in order to follow Jesus. Do you know this story? Uh, so Jesus is teaching the crowds at the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He asks Simon Peter, a local fisherman, to put out a way so he can teach the crowds from the boat along the shore. Now, Peter and the other fishermen were already done fishing for the day. They'd, uh, they'd already cleaned and mended and folded and put away their nets. And worse, they'd had a terrible day fishing and caught nothing. Uh, so, I mean, they were done done. So when Jesus turns to Peter and says, hey, let's go fishing, <laughs> I, I'm sure he got a look from Peter, something like, you know, really, landlubber, that we've been fishing all day and caught nothing. The, 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 the nets are already washed and folded and put away. Peter even says as much, Master, we have fished all night and caught nothing. And then comes my favorite part of the story. It's uh, uh, where I, I picture Jesus just staring at Peter, his eyes kind of boring into Peter's soul until Peter finally lets out a long sigh and goes, and yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. And I love it because Peter is clearly reluctant. Uh, he does not want to unfold his clean nets and go fishing again, even if Jesus asks him. He's reluctant, but... He does it anyway. I love that because it tells me that Jesus can work with reluctant and, and I'm reluctant all the time. Remember the story of Jonah? Yeah, God can work with reluctant. And so what happens? You know the story, right? Peter lets down the nets and immediately they are so full of fish, the nets are breaking. Peter first reacts like a fisherman should. He calls over the other boats for help, except the other boats uh, from the weight of the, all the fish in the nets, uh, the weight is threatening to swamp all of the boats. Finally, Peter reacts not as a fisherman, but reacts as a believer. And he falls at the feet of Jesus, right a posture of penitence, even worship. And Peter cries out, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Peter seems to understand that something bigger than fishing is happening, something even holy and transcendent. That Peter isn't just in the presence of a miracle, but that the very presence of God Almighty has been revealed right there in his humble fishing boat. So that when Jesus says, from now on you will be fishing for people, it says they left their fishing boats, left their father, Peter, James, and John, followed Jesus and became his disciples. I love this story. It, it can't help but remind you of our Old Testament reading from Isaiah, where God calls Isaiah uh, when he's in the temple to be his prophet. Another great story. Uh, uh, Real quick, Isaiah is in the temple when suddenly the foundation trembles, the temple fills with smoke, angel attendants of the Lord appear, they begin crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with his glory, and just the hem of God's robe was enough to fill the entire temple. And Isaiah, just like Peter in our gospel story, he cries out, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. Do you know this story? So the angel takes tongs and takes a live coal from the altar and touches it to Isaiah's lips, cleansing them, commissioning them to be a prophet. Now his lips can speak the word of the Lord. And then the voice of God asks, I love this, who shall go for us? Whom shall I send? And then in one of the most famous lines in the Bible, Isaiah answers, here I am, send me. Don't you love these stories? Okay, one more. 
One more story. Our New Testament reading, 1 Corinthians 15, it's the Apostle Paul recounting the story of his conversion. Do you know this story? Oh, that's another good one. Acts chapter 9. Paul, at that point in the story, named Saul, was on his way with a, his crew to a city in Damascus. He had orders, paperwork. He was to round up and capture any Christians he could find that they would presumably be put to death. So while on the way, Paul is suddenly blinded by a light from heaven, thrown from his horse, trembling in the dust, and the voice of God, it's the voice of Jesus, uh, challenges him, why are you persecuting my church? The great conversion of St. Paul story, uh, of which Paul says in our reading from 1 Corinthians 15, he, he says, quote, last of all, as to one untimely born, the Lord appeared also to me. And, and that phrase, one untimely born, literally means a miscarriage or even an abortion. Paul is saying that like a, a, an incomplete or an immature birth, he does not even deserve to be called an apostle because he at one time persecuted the church. Did you pick up the thread that connects all three of these stories? I'll, I'll lay it out for you. Peter calls out, Lord, get away from me, for I am a sinful man. Isaiah cries out, I am a man of unclean lips, woe is me. Paul describes himself as one untimely born. All three have a profound sense of unworthiness, undeserving to be called a prophet or a disciple or an apostle of God. Which leads to the next question, are they right? I remember one time when I was uh, younger, I would have been um, early 20s, I was in church and it was time for communion. And in the moment I was feeling guilty about things I'd done, things I'd said. I was, I was reflecting on just how unworthy I was to come up for communion. So as everyone else went up, I stayed in my seat. I let everyone go by me uh, and, and let them go up for communion. Later, I told my pastor, it was Pastor Jim at Kent Lutheran Church. I want to give him credit because I love Pastor Jim. Uh, thinking that he would, you know, um, nod his head and, and approve of my decision to forego the sacrament as I reflected on how undeserving I was. Instead, Pastor Jim said to me, he goes, well, of course you're unworthy. That's the point. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. It was, I, I, I so appreciate those grace moments in my life, and I, I even credit them. They become these kind of distinct markers on my faith journey, and especially for me, the, the path to becoming a pastor. So simple, and yet so true. Of course, none of us is worthy. That's the point. Uh, by grace, you have been saved. It is not your own doing. Uh, yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? God asks from our Isaiah text today, what's the answer? Who will go for us? A person of unclean lips, a former persecutor of the church, and three fishermen who couldn't catch a thing. <laughs> More surprising still, perhaps, is that you and I are called. Think about that. I think about the number of times someone has said to me as a pastor, oh, you don't want me to come to your church or the walls would fall down if I came to your church. And what I want to say to them is, oh, really? You think your sins are so grandiose that God couldn't possibly handle them? And then I want to point out who in that situation they've made God. But what I actually say and what I think they really need to hear is that no matter how unworthy or how undeserving they believe they are, our God is a forgiving God, a gracious God, abounding in steadfast love. Amen? And so God indeed calls us. God uses us, reluctant and unworthy fishermen like Peter, a reluctant prophet with unclean lips like Isaiah, a persecutor of the church and murderer of Christians for crying out loud, and St. Paul, trust me, God can and is using you. And God doesn't waste any time. The moment the words of this 
promise ring in your ears immediately. The Holy Spirit is pulling and tugging on your heart to share the good news. Do you feel it? Do you feel the Spirit prompting you, filling you, calling you, driving you? For you too are called to be a bearer of God's good news. And how beautiful are the feet of those who bear the good news. Amen? I love this detail that in one story, God's meeting Isaiah in the the, the holiness and the sacrosanct of the, the temple. And then in the next story, God's calling Peter right there in his rough wooden fishing boat. It tells me that indeed, sometimes our sense of call from God is this mountaintop experience, this grand, holy, transcendent experience like the temple, complete with Beams of blinding light, for, uh, like Paul. But for most of us, God meets us and God calls us right where we're at. Like Peter, in the humble ordinariness of our fishing boat, our daily lives and our vocations, vocari, our calling. Where we work, where we live, where we shop. Uh, I mean, just think about some of the people you encounter in your ordinary daily life, be it a coworker, classmate, a teacher, a friend, the, the, the checker at Fuller's. Now, I am uh, an introvert, so I often see people as a necessary evil that I have to endure to get through my day. And, and COVID, of course, has made every encounter worse. But when I pause, and introverts, we can take time and pause and reflect, right? Uh, and consider God's call of Peter in that beat up fishing boat. I know that God is calling me even in these plain and ordinary encounters. If God can meet you in ordinary bread and wine, then God can use you in the simplest of encounters. And God is. And, and the need is tremendous. Again, Think about those same people that you encounter in your daily journey and walk and consider how they need to hear a word of unconditional love, a word of acceptance, a word of mercy, a message of forgiveness, a, a moment of grace. People are starving to hear the good news. And, and you have it. You're the bearer of it. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the ones called to bear the message of good news to a hurting world. So I ask you once again, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And with me, I, I invite you to answer, here I am, send me, amen.
you to join with me in prayer. Uh, we'll have a moment of silence where you will have some time to lift up names and situations of your own. We'll close together uh, with the Lord's Prayer and uh, God's blessing. Let us pray. Indeed, the Spirit of the Lord has been poured out upon us in abundance, and so we are bold to pray for your church, O God, your world, and all that you have made. Lord, I pray for your church and especially each and every person, Lord, that is um, listening to this video and uh, being touched by your word, that, Lord, you would equip us to share and proclaim the good news that we have received, the forgiveness and the grace shown to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Send us out like Peter and like Isaiah and like Paul. James and John as apostles and prophets proclaiming the hope of your salvation to a waiting and hungry world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy are you, O God of hosts, and heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Lord, you reveal your splendor from the fiery sunsets to deep twilights, to the gorgeous sunrise. Teach us, O oh Lord, to recognize your beauty in our natural world and all that you have made. And Lord, may we be caretakers of all that you have called good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those places in the world touched by violence and by war. We pray, Lord, that you would soften the hearts of rulers and governments and nations, Lord, as they tend to the needs of their people, remove corruption. Lord, move us away from violence. We pray that you protect those who are first responders, be they uh, police, firefighters, medics, but also, Lord, our military personnel who risk their lives in service of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, during this Omicron spike, we pray that you be with doctors and nurses and those who are taxed beyond, um, Lord, their energy and questioning their call. Uh, Lord, we pray that you be with um, those in our hospitals, be with those who are sick, those who are dying, and those in need of our prayers, especially those we lift before you at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, with great hope in your promises, we lift these and all our prayers unto you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses just as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
The Lord look upon you with favor and God give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.